Oh, I can't wait for the Stacy magic. I'm ready. Oh, great, great. <laughs> Is it recording yet? I didn't see this. Yep. Oh, great. Okay, this theme song, uh, this week's theme song has a lot of words. Okay. You cold open, open my heart, but your act out tore it apart. I think you've got what it takes to run your own show and make lots of dough. You'll be a showrunner. So listen to the showrunner show. The pod that helps you get in the know. The showrunner show. Oh, the showrunner show. Wow. That, was your, wow, that, was, that was your best one yet. <laughs> really? Okay. You know, the, ins- no, the inspiration was. was we just went, I just took the whole family to see Les Miserables at the Pantages, the tour was around, right? And I was like, oh my God, I loved Les Miserables so much when I was in middle school or high school or whatever. My kids are 11 and 14. They are going to love it. <laughs> they could not they could not have hated that show more <laughs> we had prodded them with red hot pokers they were they were horrified and john john not john my son but john my husband his review was huh a lot of vibrato <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm like, this is the worst, like, like kind of old person, you know, like, <laughs> back home, like, Minnesota mom, like, review. It's like, a lot of vibrato. Like, <laughs> she is just a girl. <laughs> like, it's like, not enough rhymes, all vibrato. Like, just, <laughs> that was the other one. Like, not enough rhymes, a lot of vibrato. <laughs> <laughs> Before we went to see the show, John gave the kids a pep talk, especially John Henry, where he's like, look. For some reason, this is really important to your mom. <laughs> just, just be a good sport. So in front of me, John, John Henry, our son, was being a really good sport. Like, do you, you know, mom, do you like it? I was like, oh, I love it. Do you like it? And him like, um, no. But, but behind my, when I was in the women's room line, he could be fully, uh, what did he say to you, John? He could be himself and give his honest opinion. Oh, yeah, about like 15 minutes into it or about an hour into it. He turned to me, he's like, how long is this? What time is this going to go until? And I was like, I don't know, buddy. I think like midnight. <laughs> I was like, I'm just kidding. It's, you know, probably going to be like 11. three hours. But you you yeah, said was, he said something close. where he was like, uh, I don't know who anyone is. I can't hear anything they're saying. I can't hear a single word. I don't know what's going on. And I don't know who anyone is. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh. It was tough. Um, Welcome to the Showrunner Show, <laughs> where every week we demystify some aspect of the job of showrunning for anyone who works in TV, who wants to work in TV, or just wants to know how it's all made. I'm Drew Dowdle. I'm John Eric Dowdle. And I'm Stacy Shabosky. And we are so glad that you are here, and we are so glad that Sarah Mason is here for another episode. <laughs> Yay! Sarah Mason! Sarah Marie Mason, professionally, right? Professionally, yeah, yeah. Is there another oh, yeah. Sarah Mason running around? That bitch. There's not. No. Okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> this week we're talking about onset uh, supervising writers, which this is kind of funny because both of you uh, rose up the ranks from staff writing. You know, both Stacy and Sarah in the last couple of years, you know, went from staff to onset supervising writing, and and that's you know, I, I'm sure. We've learned more about what that job entails from the two of you. Yeah, you know what I mean. Then, like, then we had you know knew anything about like you know in our first shows like we just babysat the directors every step you know step of the way. <laughs> and, and they sure they it. loved nope. it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nobody liked it. Nobody appreciated that. Like nobody had I a good time. Say, yeah. Like you know, I directed a movie for M Night Shyamalan as a producer, and and the days he was on set were less pleasant for me <laughs> than when he wasn't. You know, and then yeah, with Stacy, we had a director who I just realized I was like too on top of him, and it was making him crazy. And so we got you know, Stacy moved into the on set supervising writer position. I think it was and- actually his suggestion, right? Wasn't oh, it like was. I, I was sort was, of there yeah. anyway, just visiting. So basically, our whole family of four moved to Calgary for production and then i started visiting set sometimes once the room for waco was done and i had free time to visit set then i would sort of visit just to like see what was going on 
And I think it was Everardo who actually like brought me in of like, well, what do you think about that? Or what, you know, like sort of asked him like my opinion, which there's nothing I love more than giving my opinion, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then I think he might've actually been the one who's like, Hey, how about she's the one who's on set instead of <laughs> nope. the showrunner? <laughs> No, you're right. You're right. He said, like, definitively, he was like, you should insist on having an onset writer who can be there for you, you know, to work with the directors, you know, so you don't have to. And it was a really good, you know, I, I think if you're if you're open to, you know, listening to other people's, uh, you know, like help on, you know, your workflow like that, that was really helpful. And it was you know, he'd come up to me sometimes in the morning and be like, hey, I want to change a line. Is Stacy here yet? <laughs> and I think he felt a lot more comfortable talking to a writer who's not a, also a director. And you know what I mean? Like, it just takes some of the, I don't know, some of the dynamics the out of it. more clear, too. Mm -hmm. it it's does. true. It's true. It does. As a showrunner, like, sometimes you're a little... You're, I'll speak for myself. Sometimes I'm a little too precious. I'm like, no, no, I imagined it more like that, not like this. And it's really hard to let go of that in the moment. And part of the reason you want good directors on set is because they're going to see things in fresh ways that you wouldn't have necessarily thought to. And sometimes just removing that just because it's different than what I imagined, it doesn't mean it's wrong. Sometimes it's just different. And Sometimes it's hard for me to recognize that in the moment, whereas having a writer there who's like, if it's very different, if it, you know what I mean? If it's like suddenly it's a musical number, the writer's going to be like, hey, hey, there's a problem, you know, um, whereas uh, a different shot selection won't necessarily raise that flag. And that's, yeah. I think, helpful. I was pleased that I just wanted to, that first one, I just sort of wanted to swing by and like see what was going on. And then when it was presented as an actual, like, you know, the, that's a job. There is a job. Like <laughs> the supervisor writer, you could do it and you could get paid for it. I think I was actually like paid for it. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure about, and then not to be tacky, <laughs> but it ended up being the best money I've ever made the best weekly yeah. money because it was just, in, I think it's like in TV, the, the shorter your run, the more you get paid. You know what I mean? So if you're on a show yeah. that's going to work for eight weeks, you're going to get more each week than you would for a show that's going for 26 weeks. So mm -hmm. it was kind of like that. It's like, oh, you're the, you know, you're the covering writer, the supervising writer, and you're, you know, we're only having you here for four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, whatever it was. It was like sweet money. It was great. Yeah. And on that front, I would say like as showrunners, like our education has been, you know, ongoing in terms of what makes sense for us. And I think when we did, you know, our first television show was Waco. It was six episodes. You know, John, you were directing four of them. And, you know, it was like the idea of an onset writing, you know, writer supervisor just it didn't even compute for us because we were, we were kind of movie guys and we're like, well, we're going to be here every day. Of course, we're going to be here. Uh, why would we need that? And then uh, getting into picket, it became, you know, that idea of like, to your point, Stacey, like as a showrunner, you're not paid great you know, every week, if you're working only on that every week from the beginning of the writer's room to the very end of post, you know, you have to find ways to kind of leverage your time and not be there and find, you know, weeks of production where you're not on set, where you're still yeah. responsible for set, but you're not physically there. And I think that's where, you know, we realize we, we completely depend on, on people like you two, like Sarah and mm -hmm. Stacy to be there and do that job while we're doing something else. And that, that has been a hard thing for, you know, for us to let go. Cause we're such, you know, production people and we, you know, we are precious about our stuff. So it's been hard, hard letting go, but that's why it's so important. I think to find people like you that we creatively trust so much and that will know when to throw those flags. And, um, and yeah. And like what to, you know, maybe for a question for both of you, um, like what is a type, what is an example of something that would, you know, cause you to pick up the phone and make a call? Like, I'm not so sure about this. And like, you know, you might want to weigh in on this decision or something this director is doing. Is there a specific example you can think of? I can think of a few. I mean, one is, let's say, you know, there in one of the episodes that I was there for, there was like a pretty meaty big scene in one location and we did a run through of it and, you know, it felt like a lot in one location and it was like the director and the actors were like, what if we do the first part of it outside and then move inside? And it's like, that's obviously something like talking, you know, yeah. to the showrunners about of like, I think, you know, like, I think like tight, like one word, one word change, like often isn't worth bringing to their, you know, to the showrunners attention, but 
if it's like, oh, I, I want to just cut this speech. I mean, obviously, like something something big like that. Anything yeah. really big, you're there to flag, you know, for for the showrunner. I th- I think um, <laughs> part of it you have to you have to use your uh, your judgment and develop your judgment right over when you should call in the showrunner or not. I will say, at least with you guys. I err on the side of calling you. Yeah, I'd yeah. rather and hear from you so guys like, anyway. enough, stop bugging me. I'd rather hear from that than be like, um, somebody cut four lines from a speech and you didn't, <laughs> you didn't be like giving us a holler. Like, you know, so I err on the side of over calling. I'm sure that uh, varies for every single show and probably every season of a show. Um, but I had to develop my own judgment. So for example, there's a scene where uh, Michael Dorman is uh, speaking at a grave and he was so in the zone. The acting was so good and he felt compelled not to use the character's name of the person who was in the grave. He just didn't want to say it. And I, using my judgment, went, I totally get that. The acting is beautiful. I'm just worried that the audience who isn't paying as much attention kind of needs the handholding of hearing that name. So mm-hmm. then I had to... Um, I don't, I can't remember if I had a conversation with him first and then reached out to you guys or reached out right away. I can't remember which happened, but it sort of became, he feels compelled not to use the name. I feel for clarity's sake, it would be helpful. What would you like us to do? That's good. That's good. And, and often, you know, I, I would say the first line of defense too, you can go to the script super, you know, the script supervisor whose job is to make sure, you know, all the words of the script are, you know, delivered and say, hey, you know, I think we need that word. And often the script supervisor, there's no like emotion tied to a script supervisor saying like, oh, we're missing this word and I think we need it, you know. But then if the actor doesn't like that or doesn't want to do that, um, then it maybe warrants a bigger conversation. And and so often, like, did you guys find going directly or having the script super uh, go in was more helpful generally? I like going directly. Basis. I mean, I think I didn't mind going directly either, but sometimes it would make sense depending on the actor, like, I don't know, whatever. Mm-hmm. I think the truth is the days are very long. Um, that's one thing I really had to build up my stamina. Like when I was first on set, oh my God, I was so exhausted. You know, I was like, I cannot believe I have to be here this long, just sitting on pins and needles going, should I say something? Should I not say something? You know, <laughs> and then, and then you build up that muscle pretty quickly. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, it was more a feeling like, yeah, I know they don't need me anymore. They've got all the setups for this final shot, but I kind of just want to see what they do with this one. And I'd end up sticking around longer than I had to just be like, oh, let's see how this thing turns out as long as I'm here, you know, and showing up really late and not having dinner with the kids. Cause I just want to see how it goes. But Wait, there was a point to this. Oh, anyway, the point is the days are long. And I think with uh, Sandy, with the the script supervisor, supervisor, who's so good at her job, she's really brilliant. Claire's really brilliant too. We would sort of tag off a little bit just to keep energy. Do, do you know what I mean? It's a long day. Sometimes you just want to get up there, get on your feet, go talk to the actor, tell them something, move around a little bit. And sometimes you feel like not doing that. So that was part of it was just... She and I had good communication. I think it's good for the the supervising writer and the script supervisor to have good communication. They can come to you first and be like, they're dropping that line. Is that important to you? Or, you know, and then basically like she would flag things a lot of like, hey, I noticed that. Is that does that seem like a big deal to you? And and then I got to go, hmm, oh, thanks for pointing that out. That is a big deal. I better go call the boys or talk to the actor or the opposite of going, hmm, you know, they're dropping that line, but honestly, I like what they're doing and it was kind of a redundant line anyway or their substitution's better. Let's just let, mm-hmm. it, let it ride. Should we like zoom out a little bit and kind of, you know, obviously some people Let's listening will that. know about what a supervising writer does, but just sort of walk people through like, when do you get there? how long are you there? What's a day like? Who are you working with? Like as a supervising writer, who are you in communication with most of the time during the day? Yeah, that's a great idea. What meetings do you go to and how do you segue from pre-production to post-production? I love all that. Yeah. You you do that. I'll sit here. I'll meet you my apple with the microphone off. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So you, you were often, so every show is a little bit different. Obviously if you're like in a writer's room in LA, your experience is going to be pretty different. Like my friends that have shows in LA, um, they're going home every day. But if you, let's say in this case for Stacy and I, we're going away from where we live. We're leaving Los Angeles. In our case, we're going to Canada for a month, two months, three, whatever long we're there for. And you show up in pre-production. So you're there for 
I think it depends on when you get there, but you know, you're there for a lot of the meetings, like you're there for props and you're, you go through scene by scene and the props people, this is like one of my favorite meetings. Cause I'm just like, there's a warehouse and the, the, like the, the things these prop people have, like you're looking like there's just boxes labeled and there was one that was like, I, I don't know, especially in our show, there's a lot of like weird animal stuff. And there's like, I, I don't know, I, I wish I could remember if I, if I come up with the example, but there, I was just like fascinated by all these like taxidermy animals and whatever. Yeah, but, you know, you're, Sarah's, you're sitting in the- Sarah's the vegan <laughs> staring at all the like ostrich guts. <laughs> I love it. I'm so fascinated. It's great. Um, And the the props people present, you know, they're like, okay, in the scene, it called for a knife and they show you three knives and um, the director's there and, you know, you're working with the director and sometimes you have a little more say, sometimes the director has a little more say, kind of depends on like how relevant it is to the story versus like maybe what the director is in charge of. Um, But you're working with the whole team of figuring out like what you need in each scene and you know, you do, you do that for cars, which that, you know, picture cars, you go and anytime you've listed a car in the episode, they tell you, we have this car, we have that car, we have that car. It's so fun. It's such a good way to like meet each of the departments and get an understanding of what their role is on the show and what their responsibility is. Um, and that's also your opportunity to meet the director, right? Cause you're as a supervising writer working pretty closely with the director, I, the, the directors that I work with were very inclusive and really wanted me to be, work pretty closely with them and cared about my opinion. And, you know, also I, a lot of this was very new to me and they were very kind and explaining things to me and walking me through things, which is not always the case. I, I was very lucky with that. I feel like both of those directors too, like really learned to really came to rely on your judgment as a second set of eyes and would say like what do you think about this like for all kinds of stuff like you know i i feel like that that competence of just showing up and being enthusiastic you know like really being focused like i I feel like both directors you were working with really uh i don't know came to lean on you in a in a real way it was so it, it was so fun it's like you find where you can stretch and your responsibilities and not everybody likes more responsibility i just happen to for some reason love more responsibility um but that was that nerd. was the thing like i know i nerd alert for real um you know learning who who's responsible for what on set and who's in charge and you know tv is such an interesting thing because it's like the showrunner's in charge but sometimes often the showrunner's not on set and it's like the director and the ad are in charge of set but as the writer, you were in charge of protecting the story. You know, you've mm-hmm. been there since the beginning. You broke the season. You know this show. Like the directors that come in are, are wonderful, but this isn't their show. It's not their baby. They're coming in for two episodes at the most, usually, and they just don't know it the way that you do. So, you know, it's your job to say, you know, the reason we picked this location is because it actually, like in season one, they went there. And it was a really meaningful scene. And so we're revisiting it. It's not just a random location. And they may not know that. Like, mm-hmm. it's your job. And it's like figuring out a way to work with a director, like being really respectful of the fact that like when they're there, it's their set. But you, you know, me as the writer, I have to call John or Drew and say, this is what happened. Like, it comes to me, like, it feels like it's my responsibility to, to protect the story in the show as the supervising writer. I just want to jump in and say what you were saying about pre-production. That seems like such a good time to build that communication with the director, build that trust with the director by showing that you're enthusiastic and paying attention and helping uh, with story and all that for, for every little moment, no matter how, you know, like small or whatever, Uh, because once it's production, basically just pre-production is a lot more relaxed and a lot less pressure. So you can build that relationship because then when production starts, the director is under a tremendous amount of pressure. That's not the time to build a relationship from zero. Yeah. 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 And as Sarah was saying too, like a director that comes on to do, you know, episode seven and eight, let's say, and, uh, you know, they've probably read episodes one through six once, you know, if that, you know, and so they may, you on know, a good day. On a good <laughs> day. On a good day. Chat yeah. GPT summarized. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Someone, <laughs> someone uh, gave the Cliff Notes version or something, but they're often just not going to, you know, have the have what even even of that season that they're shooting. They won't know what leads up to it, like the supervising writer. And that just makes the, you know, uh, the dependence. Uh, you know, I think that uh, any kind of guest director is going to really 
typically really appreciates that supervising writer being there to make sure they don't, you know, step in it and don't, uh, you know, make a mistake that because they just don't know the, the episodes leading up to it. So it's really important for the show to have that kind of creative connectivity, but also for the director themselves, you know, who are there to make sure that they have confidence in what they're doing. Cause someone there who knows the story better than they do is telling them, yep, this is good. And, uh, uh, so yeah. So, I mean, you guys are both, you know, like a steel trap of, you know, knowledge about the show and know every detail. And like, I found even when I was there, Sarah and, you know, block five of Joe Pickett, I would come and you'd be there and I'd sit there for 10 minutes and be like, I am just totally unnecessary here. I'm just going to, I'm going to leave. <laughs> and it was great. I loved it. <laughs> Swing by crafty. What, uh, what, what it's interesting <laughs> that the director is almost like, it's almost like a snapshot in time. Like they're, yeah. they're, this present moment, this episode or this, you know, two episode block, whatever it is like, but the director is kind of stuck in that. And that's all they've prepared. That's all they've thought about. They don't care about, you know, usually typically about future episodes or previous episodes. Like they care about their one or two episodes and yeah, the onset supervising writer has a sense of history and future in a way like Sarah, you were saying, you know, with, being a writer's assistant, being kind of the external hard drive, you know, that's remembering everything. Yeah. And yeah. I think same is true in this, in this case, like, you know, the director might be like, you know, it'd be awesome. Like, I think he should shoot that person in the head right here. And you're like, Oh no, no, you can't shoot him in the head. That person has to be able to speak in two episodes, you know, <laughs> um, you know, or whatever. Like that's a, a terrible example, but but <laughs> that's a bold director. <laughs> hey, I well, got an idea. This is crazy. How about? Um, so yeah, so pre-production but, uh, is like getting the lay of the land as a writer, making those relationships, you know, with the people you're going to be working with every day. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll get to location scout. I didn't do, I did a little bit, not much like that was because I was coming in like pretty late. Most locations were already secured, but I know early on, like Nelson was doing location scouting and, um, and then once you actually like get into, you know, production and you're, it's, you know, time to shoot, you're there. It's so, fun, you know, I mean, it, Stacey's saying it's long days. And especially if you're a writer used to writer room hours, it's, uh, you know, no, no writer's room starting at 6 a.m. And often, you know, you're, you're driving an hour away. So you're waking up 4.30 or 5. And um, I know for me, I would just, uh, you know, spring out of bed most mornings and be like, oh, I can't, I can't wait to get there. It was, it was so fun. And we were on such beautiful locations too. We were so beautiful. In the middle of nowhere. And you'd yeah. see the sunrise on your drive in and that really just like invigorated me and I'd, you know, get there. And, um, I got lost you, and was late, like four out of every five times. So I'd be like, <laughs> cause GPS, it's so in the middle of nowhere that you can't just put like, you know, Bob's burgers, like one well, Bob's, you know, you have to put in like GPS coordinates, which I did incorrectly a lot. <laughs> yeah. Actually, oh, yeah, that... Stacey, that makes me feel so much better because one day my, my, my GPS, like they send out the night before, you know, your one of the AD sends out the call sheet and it tells you the location and I always click on it. I mean, that's all I did. Click on it. My maps would come up. I'd follow it. I'd get to set. Like I have terrible sense of direction. So I like very much rely on my, on my maps. And one day, and this is like the, almost the last week. So I've been driving to all these places. You think I would know where I'm going after, I think this is like our 13th day on this location or something, but I'm just, I'm my, like it, I, I trust my GPS. Like I know I don't have a sense of direction. I'm just going to follow what the GPS does. And I'm driving like 45 minutes in. I go, this just feels weird. This just doesn't look like where I've been before. It just randomly brought me an hour in the opposite direction of set. That happened to me once too. Yeah. Oh. So I, had to call, I had to call in and be like, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be a little late. I'm heading in. And it took me a while to get my GPS story. It kept trying to send me back to this random location. It had never happened before. And mm. of course they needed me that morning too. Like some mornings they don't need you. Some Ugh. mornings they, they're like, they just start rolling. And so it was like very much noticed that I was an hour late. Oh, that's <laughs> oh. So that I'm happened not, to me once too. Seven, seven people. 
that happened to me once on Joe Pickett directing, actually, and I, you know, had a driver every day, so it just wouldn't this would never happen. And then it was the Friday right before we had a week hiatus, and I was going to go to Wyoming to visit family, and and the set was like an hour south of Calgary, so it was like, oh, it's on the way to Wyoming, so I should just drive myself and just then I could just leave set and go straight to Wyoming. <laughs> and oh, it was a disaster. It was the exact same thing. I did the coordinates, I probably did a very specific like country road, and then the, nobody out there, and I called the AD and I'm directing. I'm like, I think I'm in the wrong place, and it turns out, yeah, I was like 45 minutes away, so that was a good oh. half hour after oh. call time. I've never been late as a director, and it was a half hour after call time. Oh. It was a hundred degree day, a hundred degrees out. Everybody was just like, where, where are you? <laughs> oh, that's the worst. I think I went to visit you that day and had that, went to that same, and you know, like Calgary, I love everything about shooting in Calgary, but the one, the one thing they, they have a real like, yeah, you'll figure it out. Like yeah. you've been there before. <laughs> well, you've just figured it out, you know, like there, there's not like maps, you know, like they don't give you like, here's the map for how to get to the place. It's like, <laughs> you got this. Here's you've some, been there, you know, haven't coordinates. You loved, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Where, yeah. One day so I went to trust. go to set. There's too much trust there. <laughs> I know. I know. I went to go to set to, you know, supervise and, and I get there and I get out, you know, park and, and then I, I was like, oh, I'm just going to throw my backpack in the trailer and then go to set and, and I'm looking around for the trailer, walking up and down. And I was like, huh, what the hell? And uh, one of the transpo guys was like, John, right? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, you're on the wrong show. <laughs> I had gone to Billy the Kid and I was walking around. And I was like, where's my trailer? You know? like, I, I mean, I wasn't saying it mean, but I was like, where's my trailer? I'm, I'm confused. I quite recognize any of like, these people. Yeah. They're like, who are you? Like, <laughs> and thankfully, a transpo guy had been on our show and had moved to this show. Apparently, I hadn't realized he had left, but that's so um, amazing. So funny. <laughs> <laughs> totally. really proving something about writers here. I don't, I don't know what the point yeah. is. <laughs> I know. Um, you can't yeah. trust them to find where they're going. <laughs> so what, is there the supervising writer, you, you go to set every day, you know, you get there. Um, I like to get there early. You know, I don't, I'm a nerd. Yes. I get there early and, you know, you get your sides for the day and you'll, you'll know, you know, you know, pretty far in advance, like what's being shot. And as a supervising writer, you know, I would like the night before to like read through all the pages and, just like mentally prepare for where we're going for the day and think through the thing that's, you know, a lot of shows do block shooting, not all of them, but even if you're not block shooting, you're not shooting in order. You know, I did multi-cam early in my career and you do shoot in order and you're not shooting in order. You've got to like reorient your brain. And again, cause you're the keeper of the story. You've got to figure out, okay, where in the story are all of these scenes coming? What came before it? What came after it? Um, because, you know, what you realize on set is that, like, you know, everybody has, like, blinders on to their job. And they should. They, they, they do their job really well. And they, you know, they really, really care about the props or they really care about whatever. And that, that is what they're there for. But you're there to look at the whole picture. And if somebody, you know, if somebody in props is like, oh, they get really excited and they want to do this other thing, you know, it's amazing. They have such enthusiasm. They care. But you have to step back and go – Oh, that actually doesn't work. Like I love that idea, but that doesn't work because later on this character doesn't have a gun. They're not supposed to have a gun, so we give them a gun here or whatever the you know whatever the example is. Um, so yeah, just like being prepared going in on set every day. And Stacy was amazing. Before I went to set, she gave me a rundown of like everything I should expect. Of she even gave me like phrases to use. I mean, Stacy's amazing. She's such like a, a lifelong learner, and I you know I love that about her. Like she's always taking notes at the end of like what she learned from the experience. And so when I, I, before I went to set, we had like an, maybe an hour, two hour long phone call. And she just downloaded like what I should expect and going in with that information, like really helped my nerves and stuff and feeling like I could prepare. And I, I would recommend that uh, for any onset writer is like talk to friends that you have in production, you know, just to get their experience of like what, Mm -hmm. If you haven't been before, like try, for me anyway, I like to prepare, like talk to as many people. And if there, if there's been an onset writer before you like call them up and just say like, what's the set like, and every set vibe is different too. And like, if you can get like a little bit of a heads up about what the vibe on your sets, like, like some, some shows are like, there, there are certain shows where actors need to say every single word exactly as written. There is no wiggle room and everybody knows that it's like, and as the writer on set, you're, you have to be following along and be like, 
oh, they change this one little word and go in and say, oh, can you say it the way it's written? On our show, it's not, you know, I think the emotions are so important and the story is so important, but if a, a care, you know, if the actor really likes this phrase a little bit better and it means the exact same thing, it's more laid back of like, yeah, if you can deliver that more naturally and that feels better for you, like, let's go with that direction. Um, and so knowing that going in of like talking to Stacey and being like, you know, they, there's wiggle room here, you know, within reason for, for people mm -hmm. to kind of like take ownership and just learning all of that stuff about your set before, before you go as much as possible. And I was just thinking That's about great. that little cheat sheet I wrote for you and going, oh my God, the next time I do this, I'm going to have to look at that cheat sheet because I feel like this is, um, I did a similar thing. Like the last time I was in a room, um, I started making notes about how every day went, how every, like before the coffee break, we did this before lunch we did, you know, so that eventually when I'm running a room, I can look at it and not panic and be like, okay, that's what we did. I feel like I'm going to have to do the same thing. Like I'm going to have to review that cheat sheet because it's so long between projects. You forget. I forget. I forget everything I learned. And then, yeah, it's nice. I know to it's true. I feel like yeah. going back into directing next time. I'll be like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I gotta exactly. like take a master class or something. I forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Sarah, you mentioned like it helped your nerves. Like, was it nerve wracking, uh, showing up for both of you the, the first day of, you know, being an onset supervising writer or, did it feel comfortable? Was it uh, kind of scary going into it? What, what was the feeling? I was pretty excited. I mean, I think my overall emotion was excitement because I've been wanting to do this for so long, but there was definitely nerves. There's definitely nerves of like, I don't know exactly where to be every day. Like I didn't know going in and I, I think different sets have different protocol but like sometimes a writer is in vill video village so for people that don't know like there's monitors that are set up for the producers and it's like a little tent and chairs are set up but it's kind of removed from where they're actually filming and then the director has like a tiny monitor very close to set so that they can like quickly go talk to the actors and sometimes you're separated and sometimes and um, I ended up being with the directors the whole time. And I liked that way better. I didn't like being in a tent by myself. Yeah. Like I much, much prefer, because you're also the script supervisor is right next to the director. And you're just sort of, then it's the three of you, like you're kind of the brain trust for the episode of like, you have three sets of eyes looking at all the different things and you're just right there. I, I found it just easier um, to be to be so close. Yeah. That's yeah, a discussion takes... though, to be like, do you want me there? Where do you want me? You know, like I prefer to say to the director, like, I kind of prefer to be close to where the action is, but let me know if you don't like that. I can, you know. Yeah. It really does take some assertiveness to kind of get in there because it's often, you know, where the director is is often, you know, tight quarters. You might be in an interior location where you're just tucked into a closet and like, you know, you <laughs> really have to kind of dig in there. And it's really, uh, I find that when it's not, you know, my episode, if I'm not directing and, uh, I find like I can tend to just kind of retreat to that tent far off because it's comfortable or it's just I'm not in anyone's face. You know, I, I, I have to kind of if I want to go in and give a note or something, I always have to kind of like, you know, you know, gird myself or <laughs> for uh, diving in, you know, so I felt like, you know, both of you guys were just like you're just in there all the time. And that's what you have to do. And that's really so much more effective to be, you know, right in the middle of it versus kind of, you know, s standing on the edges. Well, I think the There's difference a too, Drew, is that like you're you're a bo you're their boss, you know, and you're also a director. Like, whereas Stacy and I, like, that's it. We're yeah. more a resource for them, so it's a yes. little. I think, like John was talking earlier, where you know, if you're a director and you're hovering over the director's back, there's a sense of like, are they, yeah. you know, questioning my decisions? Whereas, like, if you're a writer, it's just again, the boundaries are so much more clear, and you're you're not stepping on anyone's toes. As a writer, hopefully not. That's you know, you're not supposed to be stepping. Yeah, on but I think that's a that's a mm -hmm. great point, and that's why the onset, you know, the, the writing onset supervisor is so such a key position. It really is because it is yeah. just so additive and not competitive and not you know, it's really, you know, the fact that we used to not have one, John, is kind of crazy to me. Like this is, you yeah. know, we find so much benefit. 
Well, I, I want to bring like, the conversation back. Is that, do, can I jump in here? Otherwise, it's lo- yeah. lost forever. Grips on toilets. Um, do you guys see grips on toilets? Uh-uh. It's like a whole series of memes or photos. You, you were telling that story about how everyone can be in a really tiny location. Anyway, whenever the pickets or whenever there's a scene shot in their bedroom, everyone, all the really key keys have to gather in the bathroom, which is very tiny. So you've got the DP and uh, you know the head electrician and the and the um, um, script supervisor and the director and sometimes the covering writer and stuff all in a powder room anyway, so, which can be very uh, uncomfortable and claustrophobic anyway that led me to i guess there's this whole series of photographs called grips on toilets of like, <laughs> like of grips just having to sit around on the toilet of a you know of a bathroom set while they're waiting for things to happen so anyway that's go so look up grips on toilets so that's pretty funny that's pretty funny so you see why i but, had to interrupt you john for that yeah. critical <laughs> info well, <laughs> looping back to like you know talking about the brain trust of the director the script supervisor and the supervising writer like i think a showrunner should not be standing in my mind should not be standing there with you know yeah. the three of them or yeah. like and that is to your point Drew, like you know part of the power of um having an onset supervising writer is that's a that's a comfort not a threat I, I think, you know, yeah. as a director, I can speak, you know, from experience as a director, it can be very scary. And especially like, you know, being an episodic director, like sometimes you're showing up to somebody, you know, somebody else's show. This is a group who knows each other. You don't really know them, but you have to project some sort of authority. Um, and then if you have the showrunner just like hovering over you, it, it can be demoralizing and and it can maybe be showing to the actors and to everyone else that there's not confidence in that director. And I think that is, you know, I think one of the big fears for a director. So I think, you know, for me, like when I'm on set, like if there's a supervising writer, I, you know, I try to like be as far away and, you know, maybe not even have anyone know I'm even there, just sit in a tent, watch a couple takes, just make sure everything's on track. And then, get out, especially when, you know, one of the two of you is supervising. Cause then it's like, Oh, I, I'm going to hear if there's, you know, something, something bananas is going on. Like, you know what I mean? Like I don't have to, yeah. Put the hours in, but can still get all the information, which is really great. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. I think that's why it's important to like having a good relationship with your showrunner as the supervising writer, you know, like you need, you need to, you're the liaison between what's going on on set and your, and your showrunner. And I always felt super comfortable. I mean, I've been working with you guys for a couple of years. And so it was easy to make that, you know, make those phone calls and to check in pretty regularly and not, you know, it is the line of like, am I bugging? And I think Stacey's right. Like erring on the side of bugging your showrunner until they say, no, you're, you don't need to, you don't need to call anymore. Um, Yeah. But there are definitely days when like, you know, stuff's going on and you're like, okay, I got to call again and say, uh, just got to let you know what's going on here. Like it's your, you know, it's your job of, you know, not, I don't want to say like you're a spy on set. You're not, you're all, a te- we're all a team. We're all in this together, but it's like, you're the eyes and ears for, for your showrunner. Yeah. Yeah. Or one thing I just want to make sure to mention too, is like, Sarah, you were so clear in the room. Like I want to be, if you need a set super, like I want to go to set, I want to do that job. And like, that really helped us when we started getting into the, you know, mechanics of breaking the season and everything. And like, we had another, you know, we had Waco and Pickett happening at the same time. And like, okay, John and I had like a whole <laughs> calendar of the year grid of like, you'll be in Alberta, I'll be in Santa Fe, and then we'll switch. And like, we had this whole thing and like anything moved a week and it, the whole thing would, uh, you know. Every implode. time I looked at it, my, my chest, like I'd start to feel pain. I was like, I can't even, I can't look at that calendar. Our assistant had it up on a, you know, cork board in the, in the office. And John was like, I can't even go in there. Yeah. And uh, of course, you know, everything pushes a week and then, yeah it would just totally unravel and like and uh and that just kept coming back well like sarah really wants you know to be on set like we can we can count on her and so i guess my advice to you know staff writers out there story editors out there that want to you know take that leap to go on set is just let your showrunners know early that that's something you're really interested in and that you really want to do it and then if the opportunity comes up you just have to you know you know, Sarah, you're a mother, you've got obligations at home, but you just cleared the decks, you know, like we never heard about any, you know, personal <laughs> conflicts or anything. You were just there. And I think that's really, uh, you know, uh, really good to put that out there early. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that we wouldn't necessarily clock that. We, you yeah. know, we might've thought, you know, like, 
oh, she, you know, she has a kid. Like she, she may not want to be away for a while. Um, but yeah. we didn't realize maybe you want to be away for a while. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it, I, I have to say, like having gone through the pandemic with a young kid, and my husband is a second unit director, so he's on set a lot. And um, when we were in Picket Room season two, my husband was gone for like three and a half months on location, and I was just on my own juggling, like you know, a toddler and working and. Wow. you know, constant COVID scares and all that nonsense. And um, so when, when I got the opportunity to go away, even though I was working, you know, like longer days than I've ever worked ever, it was so easy. I was like, <laughs> anything that happened on set, I'm like, guys, I have dealt with a really cranky toddler on my own for yeah. three months. This is a breeze. <laughs> you don't have to yeah. cook a damn thing. You I show up and they give you I breakfast. I gave myself, they just feed you. Yes, they just feed you. It's yeah. It's amazing. When you're the person who feeds other people, that's like such a miracle. And then, and then I think the opposite is true too. In terms of, I, I totally, I'm so glad you guys brought that up about Sarah raised her hand and said, "This is something I'm interested in." And you were really cool about it. You said it once, twice. You know, you made it clear, and you brought it up maybe once every couple of months. So it was just the right amount of saying, "Still interested?" You know, want to go? Um, but we kind of had the uh, the opposite side of the coin with Nelson because he was, you know, our strong number two who ran the room for season two, and then he uh, he was the supervisor and writer for the first block. And he was about to have, his wife was about to have their second child. So he was a clear communicator about that, of being like, so happy to be here. This is great. Just want to remind you guys that when block two rolls around, uh, I'm going to be back in the States (laughs) uh, seeing my child being born, Uh, you know, which anyway. So it's, cool. yeah. it's a good thing to For, communicate. Force Drew and I to look at the grid and have yeah, panic like, attacks. Oh. <laughs> and be like, okay, well, I'll stop directing. Like, so we were directing, yeah. a, you know, all those Waco episodes too. So, was, you know. Yeah. But. I don't know. I think that's good. I think that's good in a, like a down with the patriarchy. Like it's great that dads can raise a hand and say like, my family is important to me. It's great that moms can raise a hand and say my work is important to me. And they both yep. exist. It's not like it's not like it's a dirty secret of like never say your child's name, you know. <laughs> yeah, no. But I but like just like, yeah, just being <laughs> clear about it. And and, yeah. and which of course means you have to have those conversations at home ahead of time. Yeah. yeah. I gotta say that's that's one of the things I really learned from M. Night Shyamalan when we worked with him was every day, six o'clock, work is done. That's his family time. There is no uh, no give on that. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, and uh, like, it didn't matter what was going on. Like six o'clock, he was, and and I found that like, wow, he, he like, I almost didn't feel like I had the right to say that. You know what I mean? To be like my fa- like I'm planting this flag to protect my family time because this is a priority. Um, and I don't know that that really I I feel like helped give me permission on that front. Yeah. Cool. That's so cool. Uh, so yeah, let's wrap it up. What's a, what's a good actionable tip of the week? We forgot that last time. God, I love action items. Okay, for my my action item for onset supervisor is wear comfortable shoes. Ooh. That's good Ooh. advice. <laughs> That's great advice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially if you're on. I mean, it's it's silly, but it is it is true. Like, be comfortable. Be prepared. Like, if you're used to sitting in your office all day, if you're going to be out in the wilderness, like you know, just be pre- be prepared and and be comfortable because um you're going to be sitting in some really weird lo- you know lo- on logs a lot and <laughs> tromping through <laughs> yeah. wilderness. Yeah. Which, I'm going to mean, build you, on you that. May have that show, but <laughs> it's true. That's great. It's a lot more sitting on, on logs and in like in the dirt and yeah, it's amazing. Like where you find a comfortable place to sit and park it for like three hours, you know. Yeah. Jumping on that is keep a ballpoint pen clipped to the front of your shirt. Like this. If anyone can see the video. I did. I did it every day. And I swear to God, it made me feel, I'm like, I am so cool. I'm the only person who has to You're have ready. a pen. You're ready at a moment. my nervous. shirt. <laughs> it doesn't. on her shirt. Uh, based on your reaction. A gallon of water. Yeah. <laughs> and a yeah, gallon of water. Would have, <laughs> Stacey would have like a milk jug. Like I'd show up to set and I'd see the milk jug full of water. I'd be like, Stacey oh, Stacey's right. here somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Stacey's yeah. Right Stacey's right. not far away from that milk jug of water. You gotta stay hydrated. <laughs> Oh, I have another actual item. I, I feel like um, when you get to set, just going around to every department and introducing yourself. I mean, it's such a basic thing, but just finding out who people are, 
finding out what they do. It just makes you so much more approachable as a writer. And then I, I know for me, like I wanted to learn everything I could about set. I, I looked at it as a learning opportunity. As much as I was there to do a job, I looked at it just as much as like, this is a learning opportunity for my own writing in the future. Because the stuff you learn, like if I go on to season three of Joe Pickett, if we get that, like I now have information that can help the writer's room. I now understand our sets in a certain way. Like, so one, I'm like taking in that information for my own show. And then personally, I'm taking in, like, if I get to run my own show one day, what are people doing? How is this working? What's working really well? And just using it as an opportunity to get as much out of it as I can. That's great. That's yeah, great. That's awesome. I would say introducing yourself to the actors too, because it doesn't help them to have an on set writer if they don't know the person's there, you know, yeah. like, mm. especially early in the day, a lot of actors show up to set and like, oh, I just finally read the scenes and I, I don't know why my character would say this thing. Um, and often the director doesn't know, uh, but the onset supervisor, you know, will know or, you know what I mean? Like, or will at least be a sounding board of sorts if the actor knows to look for them. <laughs> I got to start doing that. That's a good one. Well, that's plenty of actionable items. I think we it's can fantastic. say, if you like our show, please consider taking a minute to subscribe and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. And please tell a friend about us. We're doing a little grassroots campaign here, trying to spread the word. So that all really helps us find our audience. Thank you. We appreciate you listening. And thanks so much for joining us, Sarah. It's always yeah, delightful. Sarah, I love you. talking to you. Yeah, thanks really for good having to see your me. Face. Us too.